Robo Cup Federation is an international body that has set itself this ambitious goal that by the middle of the 21st century, a team of fully autonomous humanoid robot soccer players win a game of soccer complying with the rules of FIFA against the winner of the most recent World Cup. Okay, people come up with different uh, long term targets, you call it moonshots sometimes. Somebody said they want to put a man on the moon and they did that, right? Somebody wanted to, um, um, I don't know, go searching for the Titanic, which hasn't gone so well. Uh, I hope we hear better news about that. But at any rate, right, you can easily see, I think many of you work with embedded systems and so on. This is a fairly ambitious uh, uh, target. Now, let me show from three, four years back where we were. In What do you think? There's another 10 seconds left. Are they going to score or not? Okay. If you work with robots, you know how hard it is, particularly with humanoids, right? The biggest problem with them is they keep falling, right? Having two legs instead of four gives you a lot of uh, flexibility to climb upstairs, go on uneven terrain, right? But uh, try and program a robot, uh, you run into issues. Now, let's take a minute. Let me actually ask you to go from here to 2050, right? Where we have that goal. What are some of the things that we will have to do? Give me a few examples. By the way, one thing, just one minute before that, to tell you a little bit about these robots. They're about that tall, two feet, two and a half feet. They have one camera that's giving them, um, I think 35 frames per second or something like that. Relatively grainy uh, uh, footage. They can talk with each other through wireless, but they're autonomous, okay? They're, uh, each of them is controlled by, uh, they, you write code on a memory stick and put it in. There's no centralized coach or computer that's looking at everything and telling each robot what to do. Okay, the little bit that they can communicate with each other, very limited bandwidth. They're basically like what soccer players would uh, uh, do. Okay, uh, yeah. So, what are some of the obvious gaps to fill between this and uh, beating the world champion in 2050? Speed. You have to go faster, yes, but how will you go faster? Okay, so these robots are constrained to be somewhat human like. Okay, you can't give them wheels and, I don't know, accelerate and go fast, right? It still has to be human like. So, in that respect, can you say what has to be innovated? Balance. I mean, first of all, the robot body itself, right? We need to build hardware which is human size and still capable of doing all of these things. What are some advantages that human bodies have that this kind of robot doesn't have? Let's say to walk or to run. Number of degrees of freedom. Here, each leg will have six, each arm will have four, and I think they have two in the uh, neck. We have, I don't know, you, I don't count the number of vertebrae or something, right? You can do all kinds of things. Um, somebody also, I think, mentioned muscles, right? We are not controlled by uh, 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 motors, right, that are there at each joint, but there are muscles that uh, um, contract and uh, expand and so on. That gives us a lot more fluidity, right? We can balance much better. They have flat feet, right? Literally, there is a slab, like a plastic thing that is their foot, right? How many degrees of freedom do we have on our feet? So all of these things, make our bodies easier to control. It's, it's hard to engineer such uh, robots and also control them um, at the same time. Okay, these are some things. What are some other things? What is natural intelligence? It's, I mean, it seems like a very umbrella term. What are some examples of natural intelligence? I mean, other than all of you. So that, that's a very important facet. Human beings do this play, who play soccer, right? You plan ahead, right? When, when you're deciding what to do, high level actions and so on, whom to pass to. So suppose, me and my teammate are running towards the goal, right? Will I pass the ball to the teammate where they are right now? No, I will anticipate that by the time the ball reaches them, they'll have momentum, have gone forward. So I need to be able to calculate in my mind 
right? A uh, simulation of how the world will evolve. And the better players do it even farther into the future, more uh, accurately said that uh, Pele, the most soccer players they say could plan like two passes ahead, but Pele could do four ahead. I know this is all anecdotal, right? But uh, it sort of tells you how important it is to be able to anticipate the future. Point of this talk is that the fact remains, even in 2050, in a different robot body or whatever it is, there is going to be that controller sitting on this robot, right, inserted into them, that is going to be completely determining their behavior, right? There's a binary, right? Somebody will write the code, whatever, right? You download it and nobody interferes, okay? You and I can't tell them, do this, do that. They, they, they are sort of controlled by, you know, those lines of code. Now think about the problem of coming up with those lines of code, right, that are controlling this uh, robot. Who's going to do it? Shall I sit and write down? If you are in this position, right, and this is how the world looks, do this, else do that. I mean, that's what is our natural tendency. I mean, when you're told to write a program to, you know, do sorting or, I mean, we, we can sort of go through the sequence, right, and specify what needs to be done. But as behaviors become more complex, right, it's really not possible for us to intuit in that space. They don't see with our eyes, right? They don't run with our bodies. It would be a lot easier if somehow they could do it themselves, right? And that really is the uh, point of today's talk, how to get these robots to do it themselves once you just tell them at a high level, this is what you're supposed to be uh, doing, okay? So now I'm going to show you something else, okay? This is again, robot soccer, but a much simplified version. Okay, so this is called half field offense. It's, it's, only, it's like five, Defense on the blue, right, on that side versus four offense who are trying to score. Um, the offense players, they sort of stick to a trapezoidal formation. And the player with the ball, okay, only they have some latitude in what they can do. Everybody else is following pre-computed uh, behavior. Now, the one with the ball can do either a pass to one of its teammates, that is three actions, or it can dribble with the ball. Sometimes you'll see it do a dribble, it just goes forward with the ball. Or, that's a pass, pass, let's see if you see a dribble. That ball went out over there. Okay, maybe you haven't seen too many dribbles, but it's there. Did you see any goals scored? There you saw a slight dribble before, uh, at any rate, okay. So, uh, here's the deal, okay. This is an example of how far I got by writing the code on those robots myself, right? I put in a few if-then-else rules saying if you have so much area ahead of you, dribble, right? Else, look at your teammates, whoever, whoever has the widest open angle, right? There are <coughs> no opponents, you pass to them and so on. This would score goals about 10% of the time. Now, imagine that instead of doing that, right? I'm somehow able to do this, okay? I take these players aside, I tell them, it is desirable that the ball be in a position that is inside the goal. Now you go and figure out how to make that happen. Okay, I tell them this, they say, okay, they nod their heads and then they go back and do something. And then when they come back, yeah, this is the after, okay. Everything else is the same, right? Nobody has changed other than these players with the ball having done something, right, uh, themselves and then come back. Okay, there, there you see an extended uh, dribble. So by the way, the defense team, right? Two of them are always going for the ball. Two of them are trying to stay behind and uh, sort of block the angle and the goalkeeper sort of dives and catches the goal and so on. You've already seen, I think, two goals scored. You might see a few more. No, the goalkeeper actually caught that. Okay, you can uh, uh, keep watching this, but uh, let me sort of just fast forward to the point of this. Here is what is called a learning curve, okay? It's a very standard thing that you do. On the x-axis is how much time you have spent training, okay? In this case, um, you could say roughly how many games they played, right? How many episodes? An episode being they start with the ball. The episode ends either when a goal is scored, that's a success, else the opponents they take the ball or the ball goes out of bounds, right? Those are uh, negative outcomes for the episode. x-axis is number of episodes, y-axis is average number of goals scored per episode, okay? So if they play at random, right, if they choose to pass, dribble and so on uniformly at random, they score about 1% of the time. This is where I was, right, this hand-coded policy that I wrote was, I don't know, 12% maybe of the time they were scoring. University of Amsterdam had a team of robot uh, soccer players. We downloaded their binaries and ran it. They were able to score about 13% of the time. But you see these two graphs, 
right? One is called with communication, one is called without communication that are actually starting basically at random, right? But with more and more training, right? They're getting better, okay? How did they do this? What did they do in order to get to 35% or 33% uh, or something like that, okay? So the answer to that is reinforcement learning. So I'll do this in three parts. I'll tell you what is reinforcement learning more technically and then give you a primer on neural networks. The coming together of these two things, right, is what has been called deep reinforcement learning. I'll give you a couple of examples of what it has uh, managed to do and uh, how it works and <coughs> so on. If reinforcement learning is the answer, right, what is the question, right, to which reinforcement learning is the answer? So the setup here is that we have an agent. So an agent is an entity that lives in a world. That world is sometimes called the environment. And at every time step, either in continuous time or sometimes at discrete intervals, it senses the world, which means it can see, it can hear, right, those sort of things. And then it can decide what it wants to do, but it has to take an action, okay? In this particular task, the way we had formalized it, the actions were passing and dribbling and so on, but you can also model at much lower level, right? The actions of a robot can be by how much do you want to move a particular uh, joint, right? Or how much you want to, how much torque you want to apply to your neck in order to turn it. You can model at very, uh, different levels, but this is abstractly what is an agent, okay? It's an agent, it's, a, it's a, something that continuously senses and takes uh, actions. Now, we, <coughs> Uh, can sort of get into this loop, okay, in order to influence how the agent behaves. So just in terms of uh, notation, so what the agent senses, right, is often called the state. I mean, there's something called the state. For simplicity, let's just assume that the agent senses it. It tells you uh, the configuration of the environment, okay. It is something that will be sufficient for you to say what's going to happen in the future. And these things that the agent does, right, is they're called actions. The way we intervene, right, is to associate rewards with state. Like, for example, in soccer, you say getting the ball into the goal will give you a positive reward. Uh, getting the ball, let's say, taken by one of the team opponents gives you a negative reward and so on. Okay. Now, we insert these rewards and then tell the agent to try and figure out how it must take actions from different states so that it gets a large amount of long-term reward, okay? So let me just spell this out first. How must an agent act in an unknown environment so as to maximize its long-term reward? So what is significant about this long-term reward? It might very well be that the action you take right now doesn't give you very good reward. Does that mean you should not take it? It might be an action that takes you to a state from which you can get much higher reward. So if you're playing soccer, right? If you're a kid, right, a back pass would seem like the wrong thing to do, right, because it, it seems like it's taking the ball in the wrong direction, you should not be doing that. But then if it goes to a teammate who can then uh, have a clear field and they score, it's actually a good action, right? There are so many things like that. When you're riding a bicycle, right, uh, you might want to go quickly, right, fast from point A to point B. But while you are going, let's say you're sort of losing balance, the right thing to do is to slow down, regain balance and then accelerate again, right? So, and uh, this is true of many of the long-term sort of tasks that we do. So, if this is what an agent must do, right, while it is interacting with an environment, does know exactly how the environment behaves, what should it do? It can do reinforcement learning, okay? Now, this was one example that I gave you, right, soccer, but you can imagine an agent that learns how to trade uh, on the stock market, right? So, the state of that agent, right, could be things like yesterday's stock prices, when is the monsoon going to come, um, right? All the information that we think might affect the fluctuation of uh, uh, the market. The actions, right, would be maybe buy, sell, or uh, hold, right, just neutral, uh, don't do anything. What would be a reward for a stock trading agent? What do stock brokers or people investing in stocks like to do? It could just be money, right, how much you make or lose. Reward can be negative, by the way, okay? So there are umpteen uh, applications of reinforcement learning, which can really be just written in terms of states, actions, and uh, uh, rewards. Briefly, right, more from an academic standpoint about the field itself. So reinforcement learning lies at the intersection of many areas of uh, 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 study over the decades. Okay, so there was a biologist called Skinner, who's the father of what's called behaviorism. He worked with rats and pigeons, right, and found out that by incentivizing in certain ways, you could get them to exhibit uh, uh, behaviors, uh, right? That behavior could actually be learned by reward and punishment. Uh, Skinner really was the proponent of that. There are many other examples. He could get dogs that he had met only half an hour back to scale a wall. Uh, right, but he would give them a biscuit when they first came to him, then he'll stop giving the biscuit, 
and give it only when they jump right and over a period of time they sort of learn to cross the wall and so on now the mathematical basis for what we do particularly uh, in cs and in ai uh, uh, when we do reinforcement learning is the work that follows from the work of uh, richard bellman uh, in 1950s he came up with a family of algorithms called dynamic programming okay which is sort of efficient way of solving uh, uh, bigger problems by storing solutions to smaller problems so the people in operations research uh, also lay claim to reinforcement learning many of the al analysis of algorithms convergence results and so on that has come through the 70s and 80s comes from who are called control theorists um, some of you might actually be i don't know from electrical engineering background or something like that right so what we call states and actions they will call situations and controls okay instead of s and a they will call it x and u the same thing okay uh, but uh, that has also fertilized uh, growth in reinforcement learning much more recently there has been a lot of work from wet lab right they put uh, electrodes into rat monkey brains and there's actually a lot of evidence that many of the learning mechanisms in animal brains including our own follow very similar principles to reinforcement learning algorithms okay but of course the prism through which we are looking at it is uh, is ai right uh, i mean i'm a computer scientist uh, and uh, richard sutton and barto there's a textbook by sutton and barto it's there online if you want to see it is really the go to textbook that everybody has uh, followed for uh, reinforcement learning yeah and there's enough resources if you want to follow up okay um yeah so here are a couple now let me now get a little bit more formal okay now i'm going to define something called a markov decision problem do you know what a graph is something that has vertices and edges some vertices are connected to others through edges and so on so just like a graph is defined by a set of vertices and a set of edges a markov decision problem is defined by five things okay so one is a set of states okay so this here i'm drawing is an mdp which has 10 states okay for a second forget the soccer just assume we have a much simpler problem where there are only 10 possible states in which the uh, uh, world can be um in this particular mdp there are two actions there is a red action and a green action i hope the colors are rendering fine right you see red and green okay now why have i drawn three arrows for red and one for green coming out of state 1 another component of the mdp is something called a transition function so here is what the transition function does for every state and action the transition function says if you take that action from that state with what probability will you go to any other state and the way of drawing it here means if you take action red from state 1 with 35% chance next time step you will be in state 1 with 50% chance you'll go to state 2 15% you'll go to state 6 on the other hand if you took green uh you'll deterministically quickly go from state 1 to state 3 okay so you have a set of states you have these actions which you can take from every state i have only shown it from state 1 and you have rewards uh, i'm sorry i'm not giving you the rewards yet uh so these are states actions transition function we come into the picture and say that every state is also associated with a reward when you go into a particular state let's assume that you get a reward so if you come into state 6 you're going to get a 2 if you go into states 7 from wherever right you're going to get a 10 uh, uh, and so on this is one way of abstracting out the real world okay but now there is an agent that is born okay let's say it is born in state 1 it doesn't really know how the world behaves it doesn't know those transition probabilities it doesn't know those rewards but it is born and it knows that it has two possible things that it can do it can do either red or it can do green so what should it do it can't do it, it can't not do anything okay an agent's job is to take actions unless it stops time or something like that right not doing something is also an action it's the action of not doing something so red and green right which one should it do it also realizes that it's get got a minus 1 reward okay this reward at the first time step is a minus 1 now it is at 2 okay now again it confronts the question what should i uh, do red or green uh, again it does something so the first time it's doing things it really doesn't know it has to explore and find out so let's say it takes a, a red again it get, goes to state 6 and gets a 2 uh maybe it takes a green this time and uh, it gets a reward of 10 goes to state 7 so you see right it is now going around the world by taking actions but in the process of doing this is it understanding a little bit about the world you think because when it actually takes that action from that state it is going to that next state according to the underlying transition function of that uh, state right 
there is a reality samples from which are manifesting as the experience of this uh, uh, agent right so although initially it might not know enough as it goes along right it gathers more and more uh, knowledge now the question is is it possible for the agent to take actions from states so as to maximize the expected long term reward right this sum of rewards 1 -1 plus 2 plus 10 and so on okay as it goes as it finds out more and more about the world can it eventually start taking actions that will maximize this long term gain what do you think i mean it it seems a little bit uh, i mean hard to wrap your head around right you don't know how long you're going to suffer from having started with no knowledge right uh, as you go along right are you going to be learning fast enough that eventually right you'll you'll, you'll sort of know everything so it, it is definitely a non trivial question to answer but mathematically we know that given an mdp right given an environment there actually does exist an optimal it's called a policy so policy is a mapping from states to action a policy actually tells you what to do from every state okay so one possible policy for this mdp is to take red from 1 green from 2 right red from 3 green from 4 green from 5 um uh, um uh, right one of those behaviors is guaranteed to actually maximize this expected long term reward regardless of which state you start from an optimal policy is known to exist do we know that policy when we are born we don't know anything right but then as we go along we gather some experience so mathematically the question is as you sort of keep learning more and more spend more time in the world can you eventually start behaving right as profitably as you would if you follow the optimal policy do you understand what i'm saying that is like the way of uh, sort of posing this question is it possible to asymptotically reach the behavior of the optimal policy what do you think answer yes or no well yeah because i'm giving a talk on reinforcement learning you expect a question that i ask at this point of time is a rhetorical question right the answer is uh, yes and here right in on this slide is a very sort of uh, simple algorithm which has this excellent property that it guarantees convergence to optimal behavior in the limit okay this is a result from the 1990s uh, it it's very basic right now right but the fact that on this simple example we are able to show that it works uh, gave confidence right really gave a lot of uh, uh, structure right to the way the field uh, evolved so here is the algorithm i'm actually describing to you this algorithm called q learning you can understand it of course understanding why it works and so on is is beyond the scope of uh, as in this lecture so here's what we do okay we set up a table okay uh with one row for each state and one column for each action okay and what is in this uh, 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 entry what is q of 5 comma red for example it's got a certain semantics okay it is supposed to be the expected long term reward you will get by starting at state 5 taking action red the very first time step and then onwards right wherever you reach out of the first time step acting according to an optimal policy okay we don't know what that optimal policy is right but you can certainly define a quantity which is if i take action red from state 5 and then i act according to the optimal policy there is a well defined long term reward that you will get right we don't know what that is but we want to somehow estimate that quantity now if we estimate that quantity and that is actually able to converge to the uh, correct value then what will it mean it will mean that when you are okay forget state 5 because both of these values are uh, minus 4.2 let's to state 6 okay what it means is from state 6 if you take red and then act optimally you're going to get 1.2 as your expected long term reward uh, if you do green you'll get 1.6 so which one must you do right now um so at convergence if this converges actually to its true values we know that if we act greedily according to this table right we will actually be following an optimal policy but wh- wh- how why will it converge right how do we get it to converge we do something very simple and online as we go along okay so what is the agent doing at any point of time it takes an action that means it will go to a next state and get a reward right so this s a r and s prime right state at time t and action at time t at which you were the state at t plus 1 that you reached along with the reward that you got in between right s a r and s prime this is really one unit of information that has been sampled from the world 
Now that we have this, we go and update our knowledge. Okay, so we begin this whole process by initializing this table arbitrarily. You can put all zeros or you can put anything else that you want as an initial guess of what these Q values might be. But as you go, you should be disciplined and make these uh, updates to Q. The update that we make is that Q of ST AT, right, where we started out from, that is updated to be the current value for plus alpha times the reward plus the maximum, right, that is there at ST plus 1 right now in the table, uh, looking at all the actions, minus, minus of Q of ST AT, okay. So, frankly, it's too much for me to be explaining the entire uh, uh, reasoning where this uh, comes from. But at the very least, at this point of time, you see that just based on this information, right, I am going and tweaking my table. So, I started at, let's say, 6 comma red. I took an action. Um, uh, from 6, I took red, right? And uh, let's say I reached state 4 um, as, a, as a consequence of that and got some reward, right? The entry for 6 comma red is going to be updated according to the Q values that are currently there at state 4 and the reward that I got in between. Okay, this alpha here is called a learning rate, sometimes it's called a, a step size. Now, so long as we keep alpha small enough, right, and make it even smaller as we uh, go along, uh, this rule has uh, nice properties. This particular thing I have put in red is sometimes called the prediction error, the temporal difference uh, prediction error. So I'm, I'm sure some of you are lost, right? My only thing to say in consolation is uh, I, I teach a one semester course on reinforcement learning. This part comes after the mid-semester exam, okay, after the first half of the course is over. So, uh, I'm doing it, I think, in the middle of this talk. <laughs> so, uh, don't, don't feel bad if you don't get it. I mean, I'm just trying to give you enough to hold on to so that you can uh, follow up afterwards. Uh, but so long as we, we, we do this subject to certain constraints, and we do one more thing, okay. If the way we are taking actions is mostly greedy, right, most of the time we are taking the action that has the higher Q value, which is still estimates, right? But we have also an in infinite amount of exploration. Exploration means you should not starve any action, right? Any from every state, you should take every action an infinite number of times in the limit, okay? Not all the time, but if you if you look at how many times you've taken an action forever, right? That can't be a finite number. That's got to go to infinity. If you do all of this, then the result of Watkins is that Q learning will actually converge to optimal Q values, therefore induce optimal behavior, okay? So this is a very strong positive result on which uh, reinforcement learning uh, stands. However, theory is not equal to practice, okay? Now, uh, here is a table, okay? Now the font size is really small. I'll tell you what's going on here. Uh, the first column, many, many applications of reinforcement learning from over the decades, okay? In 92, Jerry Tessaro did it on backgammon. It's been used for elevator dispatching robot sensing, uh, blimp control, game playing, right, treatment of epilepsy, there's a whole plethora of uh, uh, applications. Now, can we run Q learning on those applications that converge to optimal uh, policies? We can't, okay, and there's a very simple but uh, uh, often, uh, I don't know, trivialized reason. So, in fact, there's two reasons. In many of these tasks, right, there is something called state aliasing. Okay, uh, sometimes also called partial observability. When we did Q learning, right, what was each row of that table? It was a state. You needed to be able to associate a value with every state. But very often an agent does not know in which state it is, right? So if I'm playing soccer, technically speaking, the state that I am in right now, where everything here looks the same. In one case, an opponent is one meter behind me. In another case, an opponent is 10 meters behind me. Now, based on my sensing, I don't know which of these two things it is, right? But which of those two things it is makes a difference to the consequences of what I do. If I'm going to take my time setting up to, I don't know, kick the ball, if the opponent is one meter behind me, they won't let it happen, right? So uh, similarly, uh, in, in many, I don't know, stock trading, right, you don't sense many variables which are important to predict what's going to happen in the uh, future. So um, uh, state without state aliasing, right, there's no convergence guarantee for Q learning. Well, the other elephant in the room is that the number of states, right, in many of these tasks is, is infinite, right, or it's, it's very, very large even if it's discrete. So, in chess, right, there's I think 10 to the 80 states or something like that, okay, the number of configurations, uh, well, maybe not, but at any rate, it's, it's very, very large, okay. Um, and uh, can we keep, right, a Q table for chess 
in memory or even write it on disk. We can't, we just don't have so much space. We don't have the time to explore all of those states, right, and do these updates. So almost never in practice do we encounter problems where you can put the state action space in a small table, right, and do these things that you need for getting Q-learning to uh, uh, succeed. Instead, what we do is we try and represent the same knowledge more compactly, okay? So you can see over here that the representation of the policy is often as a neural network, sometimes as a linear architecture, sometimes as a Gaussian process. You might have encountered some of these. Uh, these are sort of engineering attempts to get the thing to work. Very often in uh, theory, right, in practice, they have no guarantees of uh, uh, actual convergence like Q-learning has. So the upshot of this is that in practice, um, perfect representations, right? These tabular representations are uh, impractical. It's not going to happen. Okay. On the other hand, you use something like this. So this is um, uh, an example of a neural network, right? That is used uh, to play certain console video games. Okay. That was done by DeepMind in 2013, uh, 14, where the input is um, uh, is, is basically the I think 80 by 80 rendering of the uh, console, a few frames, two or three frames, I think. And the output you can see, right, is the actions that you can do with your joystick. I mean, there's 18 possible ones that you can do. And uh, the mapping from which output you should do, right, which action you should take for each possible input is represented as a neural network. Okay, so we're going to look at this a little bit more uh, uh, carefully. Uh, so, I don't know, I'll, I'll probably do like a 10 minute uh, aside on neural networks before coming back to reinforcement learning. If you specify what the R rewards are, these are the parameters. These weights here are the parameter and the algorithm is actually like uh, with time. Yes, that's the main difference. Also, I think just the number of parameters, you'll probably have a handful, right? Yeah, you can have like very large neural networks while you're doing this. Uh, let's say we map it onto a 2D plane and like there's some state. So how will it know whether it has reached the global maximum or not? It might not know it. Yeah, right. Actually, Q, the agent itself might not know it might know that up to a certain threshold, right? It can give like a probabilistic guarantee that I know with, I don't know, 99% confidence that I'm within 1% of the optimum. Something like that can be done statistically, but it can't be 100% sure, like logically. So if there's a valley like that was very deep, like in that reward company. So, so will it not be stuck on one side of it and not uh, really go to the other side? So, so uh, how can you make sure that this person learning is able to like is that maximum because once again uh, there's a mathematical proof it's like saying for example if you just have a quadratic function and you're doing gradient descent we know that the error surface is convex you'll go to it there's only one optimum right you can have a mathematical proof like that over here you have a mathematical proof but in general right if you're using neural networks for function approximation so this is actually my point you run more or less the same algorithm with some tweaks it works okay in practice but there's no guarantee I'm sure in practice it's not reaching the global optimum. It is using some reaching something local, which is good enough for human beings. Let me first introduce this thing called an artificial neuron. Okay, the natural neurons are all there inside your brain. Uh, this is something that, to some extent, uh, uh, mimics. So this artificial neuron is taking in n real-valued inputs. Okay, x1 through x n. What's happening is each x i is getting multiplied by another real-valued weight w i. All right, and uh, x1 dot w, x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2, literally the dot product of this x vector and w vector is going in as an input uh, to this neural net, to, to this neuron, uh, and out comes this output y, okay? But how really is y related to the uh, input of this neuron, uh, which is, let's call it, um, uh, I don't know, input, right? y is defined to be the sigmoid function applied to this input, okay? So the inputs really to the neuron itself are x1 through xn. There are these parameters w1, w2, w3, sometimes also this additive parameter called the bias or b. This operation happens and that is passed through what is called a sigmoid function to give the output of this neuron. What is the sigmoid function? So the sigmoid function is, is a sort of continuous um, uh, analog of the thresholding function or the sine function. So the sine function, right, is, uh, so sine of x is defined to be zero if x is less than zero, one if x is greater than equal to zero. So if you draw sine of x, it's going to be like this. And then here onwards, okay, this is just a mathematical function. 
But instead of this, right, there is this discontinuity here, right? It's not continuous, therefore it's not differentiable and so on. If you make it look a little bit more gradual, right, you have more or less the same behavior, but it's, it's happening smoothly. Now that will happen if you write this function as sigma of x being 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. Okay, there are also other alternatives, but this is just one example. So what this neuron is doing is it is producing y, its output as the sigmoid applied to the dot product between the input vector and this weight vector. Okay, this is one artificial neuron. An artificial neural network, right, is a composition of multiple neurons. Okay, so if you have the same input, it goes into one neuron here with one set of weights, another neuron here with another set of weights, right? You have four neurons in this first hidden layer. And then the outputs of these, right, which are all like the sigmoids, zeros and ones, they get multiplied by other weights in the second layer and become inputs to the uh, second hidden layer. You can have more layers, okay? But this is a simple neural net network with two hidden layers, which has its final output y, all right? So the good thing about artificial neurons, the reason that in the 80s onwards, right, there was a lot of, uh, um, I don't know, like analysis, right, to say that they have some nice properties. Now, one of those is that they are universal function approximators. Universal means, if you give me any function, I can find a neural network. If you allow me to have a large enough number of nodes, right, I will be able to uh, approximate your function to arbitrary accuracy, okay? In fact, if your function is defined on a finite set of points, you can exactly represent it using a neural network so long as you have flexibility in uh, including more and more nodes, okay? Uh, so this is uh, sort of good to know, right? It means even nonlinear complex functions can be represented using uh, uh, neural networks. And uh, the algorithm that is usually used, right, to train neural networks is called uh, backprop or error backpropagation. Now here's how it works. Okay, so imagine that we are solving what is called the supervised learning problem. This is not the reinforcement learning problem that I have uh, spoken about all this while. Supervised learning is an easier problem. Okay, the problem is, um, I mean, you know, everybody like Facebook does this, right? You use so many apps that do supervised learning. It, it has seen, uh, I don't know, like uh, pictures of you, right, standing with your friends on Facebook and somebody tagged it, right? This is Shivaram, this is Paritosh. And then somebody uploads a new picture of Shivaram and Paritosh, there's no labeling needed, right? There's a model that sort of says, this is Shivaram and this is Paritosh. Uh, how has it done that, right? It has been given training data, <coughs> X's, right? The X here would be the images, the Y's would be the labels. Each uh, image, let's say, has a label saying whose picture is there in that uh, uh, image. Now, the idea is that if you give enough training data and it trains based on that, given a new image, right? given a new X, it will be able to predict what is the y for that uh, uh, x. Okay, so how do you train this neural network? So what we're trying to do is uh, train the weights, right? These w's, right? Maybe these b's, just think of the b also as a w. So that uh, given a new picture, right? You will be able to produce the right label uh, for it. So how is that done? You start with any arbitrary initial weights w and uh, then you do the following, okay? Now for each of your data points J, right, in this data set, the true label that has been given in the data set itself is YJ, all right? But if W are the current weights of your neural network, the neural network is making some prediction, right? So based on uh, uh, W, let's say for the Jth data point, the prediction that it makes is PJ. Now PJ might be a good prediction or a bad prediction, but one way of saying whether it's good or bad is to compare it with the true label YJ, okay? So on the jth data point, one way of defining the error, right, that this neural network with weights W is uh, incurring is yj minus pj of W, the whole square. You square it so that, right, it's a non-negative quantity. And the aggregate error over the entire training data is just the sum of these things over all the data points, okay? Now here is the important thing to uh, note. The error, right, that this neural network is making on the data set is a function of the weights of the neural network, right? It's a function of W, right? I mean, I've literally written it down for you, right? It is sum of yj minus pjw, the whole square. Now, what is this pjw? It is a prediction that is going to be made um, uh, for the data point, right? For each data point um, by passing it through the neural network. Now, so it's, it's basically those uh, dot products followed by those sigmoid operations, followed by more dot products, sigmoid operations, 
turns out that for the reason that this sigmoid function, right, this function is differentiable, pj of w is also differentiable with respect to w. It follows from chain rule, okay. Now, therefore, because E is now a function of W, we can do what we've, uh, what we're quite familiar doing. Try to um, go down the gradient of E of W. I mean, how do you, how do you minimize a function, right? You might have done this in calculus, right? You want to find the minimum of some function. If you know what it's uh, in this, just it would be like a, so if it's Y and X, right? We calculate the, this is called the differential, right? In more dimensions, it's called the gradient, okay? Uh, it's called the derivative, I think, not differential. This ratio is called derivative. Uh, anyway, so you can go down the gradient, right? If you keep doing W goes to W minus small alpha times the gradient of E of W, you'll go to a local optimum, right? And this is found in neural networks uh, to be good enough in many practical uh, applications. Uh, the point is, for a given neural network, this gradient can be easily calculated, and this is called the back propagation operation. So suppose uh, I have two neural networks. This is a neural network which is small. Uh, this is a neural network that's large, right? It's got more layers. It's got more nodes per layer. Do you think the larger network is necessarily better than the smaller network? No? Okay, let me ask you a question that precedes that. Can every function that is represented by the smaller network be represented by the larger network? So if this network is doing something, right? You can copy over those weights to, I don't know, some subgraph of this, make everything else zero or something like that, right? So you can replicate. So in theoretical, the sort of formally, the larger network is most, more expressive than the smaller network. But why is it not a better idea for us to always be using a larger network? It can um, overfit and not generalize. So what do I mean by that? Uh, so the answer is no. Uh, imagine that we have like a two class problem, right? Where we are trying to draw a boundary between the positives and the negatives. This might be one way of drawing the boundary, right? This is another way of drawing the boundary that is fully consistent with the training data, okay? There, all the pluses are on one side of it, all the minuses are on one side of it. It doesn't make a mistake, right, when you predict with this boundary, but is, would you prefer this or would you prefer this? It seems, at least to the naked eye, that uh, if you do this, right, then it's going to make mistakes over here, over here, and so on. A simpler, smoother hypothesis is better, right? Uh, this is sometimes called Occam's razor. Now, the large neural network will end up doing something like this, okay? When we train it, it could happen. Um, uh, but, but anyway, so the standard rule of thumb is if you have a large network, you need more data, but that has started happening, right? In today's world, we have more data, we have more compute. So we're able to get extremely uh, sophisticated uh, performance, uh, extremely efficient, like uh, uh, high performance, on account of being able to train large neural network with large amounts of uh, data. So modern deep neural networks, as we call them, are aided by growth in data sizes, computational power, particularly in domains such as vision speech. I mean, I don't have to tell you about chat GPT, right? So um, uh, dialogue, right, natural language processing, um, neural networks do this, okay? And what I described to you in terms of back propagation, I think 70, 80% of the applications where neural networks are uh, working well, right? Our applications of supervised learning where some amount of this uh, is done. Okay, that was like a 10 minute detour. I told you about reinforcement learning and then I told you about neural networks. Okay, two minutes about neural networks, questions before we put these two things together. So in back, back propagation, the algorithm looked very similar to gradient descent, but there was um, the error in prediction involved. Is that where the name back propagation yeah, no, it, it, it is actually, it is just gradient descent. What's in a name, right? It, it's uh, it's a variant of gradient descent. The reason it is called back propagation is, if you um, look at this neural network, uh, let's say we are drawing the inputs at the left and the output at the Y. How will you calculate the output? You will first calculate the outputs of the first hidden layer, right? Based on these inputs and these weights. Those will become the inputs to the next layer, right? you will go left to right. So that's called the forward pass, okay? The forward pass is what you do to compute the function value, compute the y value. Now it will turn out that when you actually calculate the gradient, the way that we, uh, what does the gradient mean? Gradient means you need to know for each of these weights, right? It's partial derivative, the, the de partial derivative, the output with respect to that weight. The form that the gradient will take is that the partial derivative for this 
will depend on the partial derivative for these. Partial derivative of this will depend on the, so you will end up going right to left. So the forward pass is for function calculation. You propagate the error backwards. So that is the reason it is called back propagation. It is gradient descent. It is nothing other than gradient descent actually. So at each level, it goes one step forward and then back to calculate the error. Or after, okay, after the entire. Calculate the function value. Once you have done that, you can calculate the gradient and you will have to sort of invoke it right to left. Something that was done by DeepMind, I think in 2013 or so. So what do you think? Was the agent getting better with experience? Yes. What do you think it was using to learn? <laughs> it has got to be reinforcement learning. That's what we've been talking about. Uh, notice that this number kept going up, right? This is actually the cumulative reward, right? Every time it clears a brick, uh, that number goes up by one. Okay, this particular game is called breakout. I don't think I really need to. So basically the idea is to clear all the bricks, uh, right? Now, what is very remarkable, it was even more remarkable in, I don't know, 10 years back, is how DeepMind did this. Did this not only with Breakout, but did this with 40 or 50 other video games all played on this Atari console. Okay, they're all console games, they're different. The one that you saw is Breakout, there's also, you can't see this, okay. Uh, there's also Pac-Man, there's Atlantis, Gopher, Demon Attack, uh, Assault, Roadrunner, all kinds of games, okay. Now, I showed you this architecture of the neural network. This is precisely from the um, um, application to these Atari console. This is what the agent sees and it has to decide whether to move the joystick north, south, east, west or the north, east, north, west, right? Eight directions um, times um, two, okay? So because there is also this red button that if it press in some games, if you want to shoot or something, you got to press that button. Uh, okay, so I think that is 16 different actions or nothing. Okay, so I think 17 actions, something like this. Now, what is happening here is somehow this neural network has been trained so that if you see a particular state, the output corresponding to any of these 16 actions will be the Q value, at least an approximate estimation of the Q value of that action, just like we had done in the table, right? In the table, we had one entry for every state action pair. Here, we have an infinite number of states, but we take in state as a feature vector. We have some signals that uh, give some uh, uh, signal about the state. That comes in as input and what we are computing somehow, right, is, is the Q value for each action, right, associated and associated with that state. And then the action that you'll end up taking is the one with the highest Q value. Now the real question is, so when we were doing it with the table, I told you how the table is updated, right, with experience. Here what is updated, not the table, but the weights of this neural network. Okay, reinforcement learning is more difficult than supervised learning. It's not exactly updated using backprop, but there is, uh, I mean, some related, uh, I don't know, some inspiration from that. Uh, something else is done to update the weights uh, so as to make this happen. Okay, now DeepMind did this using the same neural network, uh, the same neural network architecture with no changes and the same learning algorithm, same parameters, right? Like the learning rate and everything. The only thing that differed when they trained to play on different games was that reward. They just used the raw reward. They didn't go in and say in this game, it's you try and do this first and then do something else. It was tabula rasa learning, right? That means you, you, you learn with no real initial bias. You just learn from the data, like the purest form of doing it. And on about, uh, I think two thirds of these games, that's what this graph says, right? 
they were able to already do better than human performance. They got human beings to play these games. This line is about human performance, right? And all of these games at that point of time, their agent that was trained using this algorithm was not able to do better, but many it was. Subsequently, this has just opened the floodgates, right? I'm pretty sure that this line now is somewhere over here. Okay, there's been so much more research, so much more understanding of the weaknesses of these algorithms and it's been improved uh, a great deal. So, uh, two, three years after that, 2016 is when this happened. Okay, does somebody know what's happening here? The game of Go, right, is a game very popular in China, Korea, right, the Far East. Um, it's much more complex than chess. It's a 19 by 19 board, right? You have these black and white stones. The, the idea is to sort of capture territory. So when did, when did the AI become human level, superhuman in the game of chess? Do you know the dates, the decade, the year? 90s, right? Who was beaten by whom? Kasparov beaten by a program called Deep Blue. Right, built by IBM 96, I think. But then, of course, it got much better. I mean, today the chess program on your phone will be better than uh, Carlson. Okay, we have like, uh, I mean, it's just, so nobody's really, this is one big uh, irony with AI, right? Once you do all of these things, it's not called AI anymore. It'll just be called like a standard chess algorithm. But then the final, the next frontier for AI was, was actually Go, right? Which was known to be extremely uh, uh, challenging. This again happened. People didn't expect this to happen so fast, but 2016 it did. Uh, okay, so this is Lee Sedol, who was the um, world champion in Go. He's, he's like the Roger Federer of uh, uh, Go. Okay, he's like very good, right? Over a long period, he's been very uh, successful and so on. And uh, this is the program Alpha Go, right? That was developed by DeepMind, which became Google DeepMind. It beat him four games to one, okay? And um, I don't know, some of these things is what makes you think about AI itself, right? A few, I think a couple of years afterwards, Lee Sedol decided to retire from professional go right this idea that there is an entity that is able to play much better than him right made him feel that he should not be playing it anymore okay um, yeah that should make you also think about all the things that you're going to try to do with agents um, at, at any rate right the i'm not going to yeah i mean at the time it happened right alpha go was a huge energy gosler 1200 cpus 170 gpus like a big team uh, whereas uh, Lee Sedol had one brain and one coffee. <laughs> he might have done better if he gave him a little bit more coffee. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's made men much more sleeker. Okay, it can run on a laptop now. I mean, once you do it the first time, you you then optimize and so on, uh, right? So very very briefly, at a high level, the algorithm here is not too different from Q learning. Instead of representing this action value function as a table, we represent it as a neural network. We gather data on the simulator, right? The same, the state, action, reward, next state, right? By playing lots and lots of games, okay? Uh, uh, either games on the Atari console or games of Go, right? Which is often done in self-play. And then we train the neural network kind of to make this prediction correct, right? You want to make Q of ST, AT approximately equal to the other estimate, which is R plus Q of S, T plus one, okay? Uh, you just keep doing this. I mean, I'm saying it very, very simplistically, but uh, uh, slight differences in AlphaGo is you don't only use this Q as a neural network. You also have something called a policy network separately. Uh, you also do search while playing the game. If, if you're familiar with search, it would be a good idea for many of you to be familiar with search. Search is what is used, I don't know, when you solve Sudoku, right? When you're planning a route on your GPS or something like that. If you're familiar with search, so search in AI, it's, it's, it's not really machine learning, okay? But it's it's a very, it's 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 this thing about thinking for, we're talking about Pele, right? Planning four steps ahead before you decided which action to take. That really is planning, right? Search is sort of a different way of thinking about the same thing. Um, yeah, so more or less a variation, like the next step of what we saw on the Q learning uh, table is what is being done right now as modern deep reinforcement learning. So uh, I'll, I'm, I'll share these slides. Uh, and, and by the way, this, this course that I told you I'm teaching, uh, I mean, all the videos and so on are there on the uh, on the internet, okay? If you want to do this in detail, right, you can do it week by week in much greater uh, depth. I'm happy to give these slides to Kavi, right? You can look at them if you want. Uh, let me just summarize, okay? The final conclusion is actually the preamble that uh, uh, Paritosh gave, okay? 
do not program behavior i mean it, it's something we can do only to a limited capacity rather you just specify goals it's much easier to tell somebody what is the job what they have to do rather than tell them how to do it okay um so reinforced learning is at the confluence of several different fields and in practice is often limited by the um, representation that is used we can't do this full tabular representation theoretical convergence and so on right we have to do some amount of engineering to get things to uh, work on the other hand deep learning right is the uh, uh, culmination of a lot of effort that's been done with neural networks over half a century right it's able to learn non linear relationships in data particularly in tasks like vision natural language processing speech uh, it does extremely uh, well it's also been used more widely coming of these two things together is is what's called deep reinforced learning we've seen at least a couple of successes uh, there are many more there's very active literature there's i mean more papers that you can um, keep track of okay it's it's really been like a, a big uh, exp explosion in the amount of work that's been uh, done over here okay and i think it's very promising technology really from a philosophical standpoint supervised learning is about looking for patterns in data right where is with reinforcement learning we are actually trusting the agent with taking decisions right it's it's like the next level where uh, um right the the agent might explore and decide whom to pass to right or uh, move elevators in a different way so when you want more and more autonomy you want to trust your agent with doing its own thing right in different environments then reinforcement learning really is the paradigm that fits that uh, need quite well okay all right so this is just to i know wet your appetite uh, i hope uh, it has done that so thanks and i can stay for more questions so i uh, follow this video channel code bullet so what code bullet does is that he also uses something similar uh, but he never explains what he does he just says that he spawns a bunch of bots they have some randomization to them and over a course of period let's say he was training his bots to uh, interact with a game or like walk or many 3d human, uh, models walk in a human like fashion so uh, he uses uh, he uses that thing explain that you said that he is some evolution based model yes yes so what is the question But i would like to know how that works i am a bit curious and yes. papers are very complex man uh, the sort of funds man Yeah. yeah so um, evolution is a sort of uh, alternative uh, way of instead of doing queue learning right which is what uh, the only algorithm i've showed you could use an evolutionary algorithm and said so an evolutionary algorithm will search the space of policies without worrying about these values it's a little bit different right so i mean take take you and me right we do learning in our lifetimes i mean as a kid you learn to do something right uh, you learn to write whatever but uh, a significant explanation for why you are able to do these things you are doing you are born as a human being right if you are born as a cat or something like that you probably won't be doing this and the process that has made you uh, optimized human being is evolution right it's a slower more long term long uh, time scale process uh, that basically works by generate and test right it, it spawns not really in any way informed by what is going to work or not it sort of spawns at random but the things that work right the right now human beings that succeed uh, right have a higher probability of living right and of spawning more offspring and so on so it's a different loop which which works at a slightly higher level of abstraction but you can very well apply that and actually some of my own work applies evolutionary methods uh, in many practical problems they do better than q learning and so on from what i understand uh, i mean chat gpt has used a lot of rl right to um, i don't know exactly what they have done behind the scenes but uh, anywhere that your reward is sort of delayed right um, and uh, you don't have like direct training labels right reinforcement learning is a sort of better uh, bet yeah so um, sometimes for example with conversations right um, you are only able to say attribute reward to actions after sort of many things have uh, happened right so suppose i start explaining something to you maybe i've said five sentences before the sixth one right everything makes sense to you right uh, and then you have to attribute that that happened also because of the first thing that i said right uh, this sort of a sequential thing where there's del delayed reward reinforcement learning is often used although for chat gpt and prompts and so on i don't know exactly what is done trying to go for long term benefits the long maximum goal but then how long should it look how does it decide how long should it look so in the task um, we specify like when the task ends right if you're playing soccer for example like you saw that there is a natural thing where the episode is reset right the episode ends when 
ball goes out or the ball is scored into the goal. I mean, clearly you have to see as far as that. There's beyond that, anyway, things have been reset. So what happens in the next episode has no connection with what you did in the previous episode. So you will see until the current trajectory naturally terminates. So in Go, you see as far as the end of the game, right? When an outcome of win or loss has been registered. I think when you're just teaching somebody to play soccer, right? You probably won't worry so much about the clock uh, because mostly, I mean, actions, uh, if you're going to score a goal, you'll score a goal in like a couple of minutes or something like that. But you're right. I mean, when you watch soccer on TV, if, if a team is down, right? And 10 minutes to go, they'll start playing offensive instead of defensive, right? Their actions actually get determined by the uh, clock. I mean, if you model at that level, you can have a higher level agent that is learning that with less time to go, right? The, the, number, the number of time steps left determines uh, which actions that you should... Uh, you can actually specify how long you have to look at. Although I didn't make it explicit, there are mechanisms to tell the agent explicitly that this is going to last 100 time steps. Now go figure it out. For many practical tasks, people have come up with neural network architectures. What most practitioners will do is just download an existing uh, model and maybe fine tune it. Okay, somebody for a particular data set created a model with 13 layers. You'll download it with the weights that they train for and then just fine tune it on your data. This is one thing that uh, happens. You don't have to again go through the process of discovering the uh, topology, right? The number of layers and so on. Second thing that you can do is do some trial and error. Um, one thing to keep in mind is how much data you have. If you have a small amount of data, then you should not have a very large neural network because you're going to overfit. Uh, so there is some, I don't know, relationship between how much data you have and how big uh, a neural network you might uh, want to take. There's something called neural architecture search that, that people do actually using reinforcement learning. But I think it is somewhat more uh, at the stage of research right now. It's not really a done thing. I mean, if you download code, um, I don't know, have you heard of Keras and TensorFlow and things like this? I don't think they'll do neural architecture search. I suspect they'll ask you to give the topology of the network. So it's not really like commodity thing yet. But uh, who knows, maybe five years from now, that will also be done procedurally. So uh, there is a lot of trial and error. See, people have some intuitions about things. Uh, so I don't know, long back, we didn't have these things called rectified linear units, which are quite popular right now, um, right? Uh, people doing vision swear by certain activation functions because I think vision tasks, some things work better than uh, others. Frankly, I, I don't know this. Practitioners in particular domains, right, might have some specific domain knowledge from their own empirical observations. I think there is, again, no, um, there's no very easy answers to how to set the activation function and so on. Space was infinite, so that is why we opted for deep learning to do it. But what if the action space is infinite? So in case of Atari breakout, it was a finite state space, action space, sorry. So what about if the actions are infinite? Can you give me an example of... Uh, an application where action space is infinite. So I had watched one video on YouTube where they were training this uh, spider-like agent to crawl. So one action that we know for sure that we can crawl in this manner. But uh, using reinforcement learning, the model also tried to crawl the spider backwards. So it was a kind of uh, crawling on its elbows. So, so, so the controls here would be applying some torque to the joints. Yeah. Yeah, and even on the uh, I don't know what brand. Yeah, so many of these control problems, as she's saying, you, you can give any torque between, I don't know, 0 and 1, right? If you sort of just uh, scale it. So any number between 0 and 1, there's an infinite number of numbers. It's continuously varying space, right? The classic example with uh, RL is helicopter control, right? Helicopter, you have rotor, the top one on the sort of tail, right? To each of them, you can give a current, right? You can also give a tilt. So that looks like four actions, but actually it is a four dimensional action. So each of those things is a continuously varying quantity, right? So what do you do? You can, you can deal with them. The simplest uh, sort of naive thing to do would be to discretize the actions. So this robot, right? If you can give it any torque, just give it uh, uh, instead of zero to 180 degrees, I mean, zero to one, you give it 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, right? Discretize it in some way. Usually, I mean, people don't do that anymore because even if it's, if it's higher dimensional, right? You have like an exponential number of uh, things to look at. Um, you can also parameterize, so here, right? In this neural network, the way that uh, this neural network is set up is state comes in as input and there is one output for each action, right? Think of an alternative where 
state along with action comes in as input. You can actually give like a real valued action as input. And if you have just one output, right, that output could be the Q value of this state action pair that you passed. So when you actually want to use the neural network, you can try lots of different actions. Yeah, and, and get the output out of it. Or you can do other tricks uh, like that. It's, it's a genuine problem. There has been also some specialized attention given to continuous actions.